All right, good morning. Uh, before I begin this morning, I want to share a little story with you. There was a young boy, Sunday school age, and he was standing in the foyer of his church, and he's looking at all these little plaques on the wall. They were, uh, and uh, he's kind of scrunching up his face and looking at him, scratching his head and looking. The pastor of the church comes in behind him and says, uh, Mikey, what are you doing? He says, reading these names. He says, do you have any questions? He says, yeah. He says, who are these people? The pastor says, well, these brave men and women, they all died in service. And Mikey says, oh. Scrunches up his face, looks at the pastor and says, 9.45 or 11.30? Uh, so you choose. Uh, I'm going to talk about choice today, and um, I believe, and I believe that it is in alignment with our teaching, that life can be better for people, and it depends very much on the choices people make. We live, science of mind teaches us, in an intelligent universe, yet we can act unintelligently. Isn't that extraordinary? We live in an intelligent universe. We say God is everywhere and God is infinite intelligence, so that means that infinite intelligence actually exists within me, and yet sometimes I behave like that is the furthest thing from the truth. Oh boy. You know, we can make wrong decisions. That's acting unintelligently. We can limit ourselves with things like sickness or uh, financial lack, uh, uh, being in a bad relationship, uh, feeling like our, uh, our, our creativity is completely frustrated. I think all of this is, is unnecessary. Now, we may believe that we are limited in some way, but let's be very clear. The universe is not limited. Since we are created by divine intelligence, we must be intelligent beings. And again, I say the, pro the reason we have trouble is the troubles result when an unintelligent factor is introduced into a field of intelligent activity. What's an unintelligent factor? Things like worry, fear, hate, resentment, all those low-level negative things, they are unintelligent. Let's take worry as an example. We'll just start with that one, okay? Worry, you can think of worry as like the gestation period during which a negative situation is produced by our thought and ultimately appears in our experience as a problem, right? That's what worry is. Worry is that time from when we get the idea till it actually shows up out here on the physical plane. Worry is a problem prayer. People don't understand this. They think, well, I worry because I love you so much. I worry because I care. I worry because on and on and on. And you're justifying a problem prayer. It's not the best use of an intelligent principle to worry. What could we do instead? I would suggest a treatment. I would suggest some affirmations. I would say visualize. I would say take out a book that's filled with spiritual truth and read it to yourself out loud to help change your mind, but don't keep worrying because every time you worry, you're praying the problem into being. You're focusing on what you don't want. But the universal subjective doesn't hear, don't create this. The universal subjective here is, wow, he is focusing on this so much. This must be what he really wants more of. So we might say, well, everybody has some degree of, of worry or, or fear or hate or resentment or whatever those things are. But because everyone has them does not make them so. It doesn't make them spiritual truth. There's enormous agreement in the world that we live in for error. There's an enormous agreement in the world that we live in for separation from God. You know, so all the sickness in the world cannot disprove health as, uh, or a wholeness and health as an attribute of divine spirit. Just because people have lots of sorrow does not disprove joy as a quality, as an attribute of God. Those qualities and those attributes exist within us. So I believe, we believe in science of mind, that health and joy and abundance and love, self-expression, these are the normal modes of living. These are how we should be experiencing life. But you know, it's interesting. We cannot go beyond our own self-accepted image. So if you see yourself as not much, 
you're not going to go very far. Right? So as long as you underestimate yourself, you're not going to be all that you could be. Spirit within you is not going to be fully expressed. So you might say, well, but you know, I have just made so many mistakes. I've made so many mistakes. Well, first of all, welcome to the club. Do you actually know anybody who hasn't made any mistakes? I don't think there's anybody on earth. But, but I think we want to not judge ourselves by what we have done. Maybe another way is if you're going to judge yourself, do it in terms of what you will do. Because who you are as a spiritual being is you are the present in the process of becoming the future. Yes, you're creating that. You are a potential of infinite mind, and this mind knows only this now moment, right? You're not your past. Every living person has made mistakes. Everybody has a past, but you know the thing we can all agree upon about the past? It's not here now, is it? It is not here. You can't touch it, right? So you may say, well, I have, I, I have a lot of problems. Well, you know, life never made a problem person. Let's be clear about that, OK? Life has never made a problem person. It made a person who is capable of handling problems. Who is that person? You! You are that person that life has created to handle the situations that show up. So you have to tell yourself, I am the person who sees the problem. The reason I notice the problem is to be able to activate the, the ideas necessary to solve the problem. Ideas not physical bodies are what solve problems. Because this is the way the infinite mind gives to each of us when we have a difficulty, is God gives us an idea of what to do to fix it. And God gives us an idea of what to do to fix it. And God gives us an idea of what to do to fix it. And we think when those ideas are delivered that they have gone to the wrong mailbox. Yes, we think, oh no, this is not for me. This must be for my neighbor. God surely didn't think I'm the person to do this. Yes, God did. That's why God gave you the idea. So remember that um, uh, thinkers change the world. And each of us here, we are those thinkers. Right? There is nothing to oppose you but, um, I would say, this, your own subconscious patterns of uh, fear and doubt and frustration or inferiority. It's those unconscious patterns. See, Ernest Holmes says, for us to have a demonstration, we have to have both conscious and subjective agreement. So our conscious mind is totally with the program. We want to go forward. We want life abundant. We want to be healthy and happy and all of those good things, right? Yes, we do. Go like this. Yes, we do. <laughs> However, our subconscious mind thinks things that are contrary to that. Right? And so that's where the problem lies. So if we take stock of our personal alibis, you know, I know I'm on thin ice here, and I apologize for that. But if we all took stock of the excuses we use, the excuses we use that keep us small, uh, that hold us back, the excuses and alibis we have for our mistakes, these will reveal to you the patterns in your subconscious mind that are the things that are getting in the way. These are the thoughts, the beliefs, the ideas that need to be negated, released, and healed for all eternity. So Ernest Holmes says this. He says, there is no sin but a mistake. And there's no punishment but a consequence. So the reason I'm talking about choice today is I want us all to understand that there are just consequences. God doesn't punish us because we make a bad choice. You know, the universe doesn't punish, right? Punishment does not enter into divine consciousness. God only knows to give of God's loving, intelligent, abundant self, right? But there are consequences when we make choices that are not intelligent. So, you know, God can only do for you what you are willing to do for yourself. And people like to say things like, well, I can't help being what I am. Well, if you can't, who can? That's what I want to know. If you can't help it, who can? You are the one who can. See, we all, I think, have to wake up to a great fact of life, that you and I, we alone, are the ones who are responsible for our life and the way it's turning out. And if you don't like the way it's turning out, maybe not your whole life, maybe just one particular area, then you get to say, hmm, could I make another choice in this area? Is there something else I could focus on? Is there something else I could believe? Is there something else I could practice that would lead me along a greater path of happiness and fulfillment? See, because when you know the truth, 
You are set free from whatever the untruth is. The principle is the light always casts out the dark. So no matter how long you have believed untruth, no matter how long have you believed in an error, no matter how long you've believed, oh, I'm going to be sick forever now, or I'm always going to struggle around money, or I'm never going to have somebody I love in my life, no matter how long you've wrestled with those limiting ideas, as soon as you start to believe in a greater truth, you are set free from those limiting ideas. You, know, you have to know yourself. You are spirit that is evolving. You are spirit that is expanding. You are spirit that is a principle of intelligence itself, and you set yourself free from former negative patterns. And part of how we do this is that we don't blame God, you know, or our exes, you know, or our family, or anybody else. I love the story of, uh, in the New Testament of Jesus at the healing waters of Bethesda. It's one of my favorite stories in the Bible, probably because I have been there in, uh, in Israel. And, uh, and, and that was uh, very, very thrilling for me because I'd read the story so many hundreds of times before I went there. So the story is that Jesus and the disciples come to this place where there are these uh, healing waters. And there's a man laying there. And he's been laying there for years. Can you imagine waiting years and years and years for his healing? Now, Jesus is not interested in the past causation in the mind of the man at the pool, right? Like, Jesus doesn't say, so, was there abuse? <laughs> you know? Were you hurt badly? Did somebody damage you? Did somebody not love you? What happened? You know, tell me all of it. Pull up a pallet. Tell me, you know. We'll just, I, I want to know it all. You know, that was not what Jesus was interested in. Jesus said, wilt thou be made whole? Do you want to be better? Do you want to be well? Do you want to be happy? Do you want to be free? Wilt thou be made whole? And I said, yeah. And Jesus says, well, all right. Pick up your bed and walk. And the guy does. He just does. So to me, this is like the greatest example of knowing the truth will set us free. Because Jesus wasn't interested in why he was there or how long he'd been there or what led to him being infirmed, laying by the pool. You know, instantly he was cleared of the negative thinking. Years of limited thinking, negativity, defeat, all of that stuff. In a moment, it was wiped clear. See, because all improvement is dependent upon your seeing yourself as being greater than your current circumstances. That's true for all of us. We have to all see ourselves as more than the current circumstances we are in. Because the current circumstances we are in only exist on the physical plane. And who you are is a multidimensional spiritual being. This physical plane does not define you. It's just one aspect. You know, it's like... Somebody said to me the other day, say, wow, your hair has gotten so gray. I said, thank you. Thank you for noticing. And I meant that sincerely because I said, in my family, we're just glad it's hair. Okay? So if I took one hair, if I took one hair and I pulled one hair out, that's not all of the hair on my head, right? So... There's nothing, why am I saying that? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> really, I don't. But I did get the hair in my family, and I'm very grateful for that. There's nothing wrong with having what you want, as long as it harms no one, as long as what you want does not violate anyone else's free will. Oh, there's the word right there. Because people say, well, why does God let us even make bad choices that have bad consequences? Because God created each of us to be spontaneous beings, right? Spontaneous beings with free will and choice to evolve at our own rate. Or as I like to say it, where does good judgment come from? Bad judgment, usually. Yeah. <laughs> At least for me, it has. You know, I mean, I've had to make the wrong choices again and again before I learned to make better, more correct, more right choices. So as long as you think and feel what you don't want, your mind will continue to create 
your own private self-accepted hell on Earth. And, and it's just a consequence, that's all. As long as you continue to think and feel what you do not want, you keep producing that. Right? But the minute, in an instant, St. Paul says, in the twinkling of an eye, in an instant, it can change. See, because if you're just half-hearted about it, you know, like when you sit down to do your prayer work and you're kind of half-hearted about it, you think, well, I have a couple minutes, it's better than nothing. Let's let me squeeze this prayer out and I can get on with my day. Half-hearted efforts accomplish very little. You know, you've got to put your whole heart and soul into it. So into our consciousness, I believe, is pouring at every instant a flood of new ideas that are coming from the infinite spirit through us. Every instant, the infinite mind is trying to flood us with healing ideas. These are the living waters which Jesus said, if we would drink therefrom, we would never thirst again. If we would receive the ideas that God, that spirit, that the universe is constantly trying to give us, if we would receive these and act on them, we would never thirst again. But you know, people just want to say, well, I'm just going to hang out in the place where I don't choose. I want to not choose. And I'm here to tell you that not choosing is a choice. It is. Not choosing is a choice. And the problem is when we don't choose, somebody else will usually choose for us. And what they choose will usually be in their best interest, not necessarily ours. Do you understand? Yeah. So people are going to, people are going to do that way. So, not choosing is a choice. And you say, but people, and, and people don't want to choose because they say, well, what if I make the wrong choice? Well, if you make the wrong choice, you can choose again. How great is that? You can just choose something else. Like, wasn't it Forrest Gump who said, life is like a box of chocolates? Right? You know? So I don't know about you, but I'm that person who, if I bite a chocolate and I don't like it, I can pitch it. I don't have to eat the whole thing just because I bit it. You know, it's like, no, nope, it's not good to me. I don't like this. Out it goes. The universe has infinite good. Or as the way I like to say it is, there is no end to my good. There is no end to my good. I say that every day. There's no end to my good. Say that with me now. There's no end to my good. Doesn't that feel good? It does. Like, so we'll say it again and let it kind of sink into the cells of your being. There's no end to my good. Yeah. I like that. Because when I think of my good, I think about health and wealth and love and on and on and on. Choices, the choices we make can change our life. And I think we want to make choices that are expanding us, that are empowering us. We want to make choices that make us feel more alive, that make us feel really, really happy to be here. Because the choices we make have infinite consequences. You know, we teach that there's a law that we set an action in motion, and a reaction from the universe comes back. And we set the law in motion, and a reaction comes back. It may be that the choices we think of as most insignificant, I was thinking about this, and I was thinking maybe those choices we think that are really insignificant, oh, this doesn't matter, those are actually the most powerful. And why I say that is it could be that those little choices cumulatively have an impact on our soul on our well-being, on our actual life path. So what choices can you make that will really matter in your life, in the days, weeks, months, years ahead? What choices can you make that will really impact your life in a healthy, constructive way? So the things that we have feared and I would say this is probably true for almost everybody, if not everybody here. Most of the things that we have feared happening have never happened and actually will never happen. So the first question I want to ask you this morning with regards to this is, is there a word that you could choose today to never use again because it limits you? It holds you back. It keeps you small. It keeps you sick. It keeps you alone. It keeps you separate. Is there a word that you could choose today? Right? Because if you make a choice, there are going to be consequences from that. Do you know 
if there's a word in your vocabulary that you need to stop using because it's holding you back. The other question I want to ask us is, well, I think about it like this, that today, this day of my life will never come again, right? I mean, we're never going to be in this exact configuration with these exact people, you know, on this exact day. We're never going to get to do this again, just like this. Hmm. So if I never get to do this again, just like this, what choice could I make? And I want you to ask yourself this very seriously. What choice could I make right now that would support me, that would empower me in a healthier life? Just one choice, one little choice. I don't know what that is for you, but I know that spirit within you does. What's one choice that you could make right now that would empower your life to be a more loving experience? What's one choice you could make right now that you know if you really chose this, your life would be more abundant? Because all of our choices, bar none, have consequences, right? No punishment, just consequences. And I think that God has given us this incredible gift of free will and choice because this is how we evolve. Isn't it time we do? Let's pray. So we turn our attention inward for a moment now, remembering that we are surrounded and filled with God's infinite loving spirit. That each and every one of us is a place where the divine intelligence of the universe knows itself as us. That we are all emanations of the most high God. And so in this awareness of our oneness with God, I further know we are all connected with each other on the unseen side of life. I speak the word for us that we are conscious of the choices we are making. And if there are choices we have made up until now that do not serve us, I speak the word for us that we are done with them, that we recognize they do not serve us, they do not support us in being more, they do not empower us. And I claim for us that we are very aware that every choice we make has consequences. And we choose those things that absolutely support greater life, greater love, greater abundance, greater creativity. We choose those things that support expansion, and greater expression. So I know what does not serve us is easily and gently released and let go. We don't have to have claw marks in any of it. We just let it go. And the way is made clear not only for healing, but for the newness of spirit to flood into our life and express in ways that we had never even dreamed of. So we include in our prayer our family members and friends, our parents and children, all of those we love and hold dear, and we know right where they are, God is fully present, as perfect healing, as all needs met, as peace of mind. We let our prayer be a blessing in the world that we live in, this world that pulls at our attention so much with things from the news and the newspaper and the radio and TV and the internet, on and on and on. There's so much going on. And yet we believe in a God, an infinite intelligent principle that's big enough to enfold all of it and every single person in the arms of infinite love and peace and healing and we claim that right now. We bless our church, we bless all churches. We bless synagogues and temples and mosques and ashrams, all paths to God. And I know we're blessed by being together, that there is raising up, there is healing for every one of us. And so with an open, gracious, full heart, I say thank you God that this is so. I release this word, and so it is. Together we all say, Amen. All right, we'll sing one time together. <laughs>